Greetings again all, this is the Pinterest High School AP Physics 1 video series. This is video 4B, it's uh, Newton's Laws for Circular Motion. So we've already seen that um, objects that are in circular, uniform circular motion are accelerating even though the speed is constant. Uh, we know that in order to make an object accelerate, it's got to have a net force acting on it. So now we're going to look at the kinds of forces that can make objects move in circular paths. Now, we know that the acceleration of an object in uniform circular motion acts towards the center at all times. That's why it's called centripetal acceleration. Uh, therefore, whenever an object moves in a circular path, it must also have a net force acting in the same direction as the acceleration, which means towards the center. We say that the object has a net centripetal force acting on it. <clears throat> now we're going to see that uh, virtually all the forces that we've used up to this point, uh, gravitational forces, normal forces, uh, tension forces, contact forces, and friction uh, can all act as centripetal forces. Now the initial step for uh, applying Newton's laws to circular motion is the same as it was before. Uh, we create a free body diagram. We have all the forces acting on it. Um, in the case of circular motion, we, we don't have to make a decision about which of Newton's laws applies. Um, if the object is moving in a, cir a circle, automatically there must be a net force, so we automatically apply Newton's second law or sigma f equals ma. Now, we know that when we used Newton's second law for linear motion, uh, we looked at sigma fx equals ma x in the x direction, sigma fy equals ma y in the y direction. Uh, when we have circular motion, we're going to write the law this way, uh, sigma fc equals mac. And again, that c is the centripetal direction. We recognize the a sub c as the centripetal acceleration, so automatically we can say sigma fc equals mv squared over r. Uh, you might recognize the v squared over r as the centripetal acceleration. So this in the blue box here, this is the governing equation for Newton's laws for things that move in circular paths. Now the subscript C, of course, uh, refers to the centripetal direction, which is also called radial because we're concerned with forces that act along the radius of the circular path, in the direction of the radius. When we use our free body diagram to construct a f force equation for the circular motion, <clears throat> we're only concerned with forces that act along this radial direction, that is, either in or out. Um, as such, we need a new sign convention for centripetal or radial forces. And very simply, um, forces that point in, we're going to say, are positive, And forces that point out, we're going to say, are negative. So we need to be careful uh, at all times. Uh, we got to be aware of which direction is in and which direction is out. Based on where the object is in the path, the inward direction could be up or down or sideways, um, but we got to be very clear about it. Any forces that point inward, we then consider to be positive, and any forces that point outward, we consider to be negative. This will make up the left side of the force equation, sigma fc. The right side we know is automatically mv squared over r. <coughs> now, at some point, We'll digress for a moment. At some point you may have heard the term centrifugal force. Uh, usually this is described by a seventh grade science teacher swinging a bucket full of water in a circle and the water stays in the bucket and the teacher says, oh, because centrifugal force keeps the water in the bucket. It's not true at all. Um, centrifugal means away from the center, uh, which means outward. Uh, and in fact, this has nothing to do with objects that move in circular paths. Uh, in fact, centrifugal forces work uh, against the object moving in a circular path. 
So the net force must act inward for an object to move in a circular path. Centrifugal forces act the other way and they are not they're they're involved with Newton's laws for circular motion, but they don't really contribute to the circular path, they actually detract from it. Now we're going to look at a number of forces that you're familiar with, um, but we're going to look at them, how they apply in situations where we have an object moving in a circle. So first we'll look at gravitational and normal forces. Um, if we consider a Ferris wheel, right, the wheel turns at a constant speed, and in these cars, of course, there are people, and the people in the cars uh, undergo uniform circular motion. So it just moves around at a nice steady rate. If we look at a, a person that's in the car at the top, so there's a person in the car up here, uh, we construct a free body diagram, and again, there's nothing new here. We know FG, we know FN. Um, FG always points down, and assuming the person is sitting in a chair, the FM would point up. Now, when, when the car is at the top, again, we need to be careful about which way is in. Okay, when the car is at the top, down is the inward direction. So down would be positive and up would be negative because down is in and up is out. So when we write our centripetal force equation, sigma FC equals mv squared over r, Fg is positive because it's inward, Fn is negative because it's outward, and then of course the right side is mv squared over r. Now, <clears throat> when we look at somebody at the bottom of the Ferris wheel, so this car at the bottom, the free body diagram looks the same. We still have an FG, we still have an FN. But the force equation is going to be different because now when it's at the bottom, up is the inward direction and down is the, out, is the outward direction. So when we write the force equation for the bottom of the Ferris wheel, FN becomes positive, FG is negative, and then the right side is MB squared over R. So you can see that what happens here is as the Ferris wheel turns, what changes in terms of the people in the cars is the normal force. Gravitational force is constant, and we've already said that the magnitude of the velocity is constant as it turns. So we would find that the, the normal force is at a maximum when the car is at the bottom, and it's at a minimum when the car is at the top. And again, you can just take the force equations and solve them for Fn. Uh, what we see is that a lot of uh, amusement park rides um, use circular motion to manipulate your normal force. Uh, your body is very good at perceiving changes in the normal force. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of people, it's a physical feeling kind of in your stomach, um, sometimes in your head or your inner ears. Um, it can be hard to describe. But either way, some people like it and some people don't. Uh, the people who like this feeling uh, are called thrill seekers and they like to accelerate. They love roller coasters. They end up bungee jumping and jumping out of airplanes. And um, for other people, sometimes changes in your FN actually uh, can make you physically sick, make you nause nauseated. Um, and we've all seen people throw up either on a ride or when they get off it. So um, again, it all has to do with, um, with changes in your normal force. Now what we've, we find is that a similar type of analysis works for any uh, circular path that is vertical and involves a normal force. So you might have a car going uh, over a semicircular hill. You'll see this in your web assign uh, going through a uh, semicircular bowl-shaped valley, a uh, pilot in a plane pulling out of a dive, um, roller coasters with circular loops. Um, there's lots of examples of vertical 
circular paths. Now we're going to look at uh, friction as a centripetal force. Um, we're looking at this, uh, this road and the car on the turn uh, from above. Uh, we've all been in a car that um, moves through a turn and maybe the pavement's wet or there's leaves on it or ice on it and the car loses the grip on the road and the car um, sort of slides out of the circular path. This car is kept in the circular path by friction between the tires and the road. Okay, the friction force is the only force that actually points in towards the center of the path. So we would say that the friction force equals mv squared over r. Again, the m is the mass of the car, v is how fast it's moving, r is the radius of the turn, and um, again, we're already we're already familiar with the maximum friction force that can exist between an object and a surface. Uh, we know that it's mu times Fn. Uh, assuming the road is flat, we can say that Fn equals mg. Um, it's not on the diagram because it actually points into the screen. Um, mg points into the screen. Fn, of course, points out of the screen at you. So what this allows us to do is relate the, the, the maximum speed that this car can go through the turn with um, that'll be associated with the maximum friction force. And if the car goes any faster than that, the friction force is not available. So the car would actually skid. Uh, what we would see is that mu times mg, which is our friction force, maximum friction force, <clears throat> uh, we say it equals mv squared over r, where v is the maximum velocity that the car can have through the turn. We see that the mass goes away, and we rearrange. And we see that the maximum velocity is the square root of mu times gr. Um, again, if the car goes any faster than that, it won't stay in the turn. It'll actually skid and um, go off the outside of the highway. You'll notice on roads like this, they usually have guardrails on the outside, but not necessarily on the inside, because cars never go off the inside of the turn. They always go off the road on the outside, because the velocity at any point is tangent to the path. So when it loses grip on the road, the car actually goes this way. All right, now we're going to look at <clears throat> vertical tension as a centripetal force. Consider a ball on the end of a string. We're going to whip it around in a vertical circle. Uh, the ball has a mass m, and the string is of length r. At each of the four points of interest, a, b, c, and d, we're going to draw a free body diagram and write the centripetal force equation. So we'll look at point A, and again, at, at point A, the top down is positive. Right? We have Fg pointing down, as it always does. And then, of course, we have Ft. And again, this, as far as the ball is concerned, the string can only pull. So the string is going to pull down at that point A. We have Ft and Fg both pulling inward. And when we, um, when we write the force equation, they're both positive. Fg plus Ft equals mv squared over r. Um, what you'll notice when we look at the other points, look at point B, look at point C, look at point D, uh, you'll notice that the tension in the string varies as the object moves through its vertical path. But that Ft always points in, at least from the perspective of the ball. Uh, the tension is at its maximum at the bottom, it's at its minimum at the top, and it cycles back and forth between maximum and minimum as it goes around the, ver the vertical path. Again, you'll see this in the web assignment this week. Uh, now we're going to look uh, very quickly at tension and horizontal paths. We have what's called a tethered flyer. Uh, it's a little helicopter attached to a string, which is then attached to a um, clamp at the top. You'll see a couple of these set up in the classroom. 
the path of the helicopter is actually a horizontal circle. This is also called conical pendulum. And again, what we see is that the string can only pull. So as far as the helicopter is concerned, that tension acts this way, up along the string. The tension has two components. One pulls up and it counteracts the weight of the helicopter or the FG of the helicopter. And the other pulls inward in the X direction towards the center of the circle. Anywhere in the path, that X component of the tension is always going to point towards the center of the circle. So now you can draw the free body diagram of the helicopter, draw it right on your notes, and then we're going to set up two force equations, the sigma Fy, which is the vertical component of the tension and the Mg, and then sigma Fc, which of course is the horizontal component of the tension, which points inward, equals mv squared over r. Okay, so that's it for Newton's laws and circular motion. Next up is universal gravitation. Until then, enjoy, and I'll see you soon.